Oh, hello! I know it's been many years since I've last uploaded a video, so allow this to be my uh, peace offering with everyone. I'm back. I'm here in RPG Maker VX Ace, and I'm going to be showing you some cool tutorial things. Wow. Alright, let's get started. Now, I won't show you in this video how to unpack a Lisa the Painful fan game, or Lisa the Painful or Joyful themselves. Uh, but, if you'd like a tutorial for that, I think on almost every single Lisa Discord server, you can find someone who has graciously given you the instructions to do that. It's very easy to do. Uh, just a few notes if you're choosing to do something like that. Keep in mind a handful of things. The first being that you'll probably need to disable any antivirus software if you're going to be using a decryptor, which is necessary to get all the files of a Lisa game. And secondly, after you've taken care of that business, make sure that you have a legal copy of Lisa if you're going to be working with anything fan work related. I know that Austin has been pretty generous with his legal approach to most fan games in comparison to most other developers, so I'll leave that as, it, uh, as your own interpretation of what that should look like. Besides, if you haven't already played Lisa proper, I don't know what you're doing watching a video on how to make Lisa fan games. That seems pretty uh, absurd to me, but I'm not you, so who really knows? So today, we're going to be working with Lisa the Hopeful. If you don't know, it's a 2017 fan game based off of Lisa the Painful. And we're just going to be working with its files. Uh, credit to the artwork is the numerous people listed at the end of the credits of Lisa the Hopeful and Taco Salad, uh, developer of the game himself. So what am I going to be showing you in this video? I'm going to be showing you a series of different things. We'll be starting off with... Uh, basic tile sets and how to set up a general map, how to, once again, set up a basic battle event, but with more interesting little frills and such, uh, how to do basic jumping animation and how to set a common event for that, and the internals of battle mechanisms uh, to boot. This stuff is pretty easy to get a grasp of, so when you're done here, I would recommend getting your own uh, copy of RPG Maker VX Ace, opening up one of these fan games, or Lisa themselves, and uh, just playing through this uh, with this program and figuring this stuff out again. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I gained all this experience, excuse me, through practice and not through uh, just studying up on this. And that's really the best way to get acquainted with this program, because the more time you spend learning, uh, you know, through practice, the more time you're going to uh, be able to have both fun and you'll actually have practical practical knowledge rather than just theoretical knowledge, which uh, it helps in some instances, but you can look most of that stuff up. You're not going to be tested on any of this is what I'm saying. So you're better off just trying to get a good feel for how to use your hands and, and mind in assembling uh, Lisa things. So let's start off with uh, introducing our uh, whole system here. On the left side, we have what's called a tile set, and these are files that you have, uh, you can place into your RPG Maker uh, VX Ace programs or any RPG Maker uh, program. And these have grid based, uh, well, I shouldn't say grid based, these are grids in which you can align your artwork into these grids and place them onto the map in order to assemble a map. Um, or I should say, assemble an environment or a, a uh, landscape. Because Lisa is a side-scroller, it doesn't do things in the conventional uh, style. Here's just a reference. Uh, if you look at this, what I'm assembling here, uh, you have a sort of a pseudo three-dimensional object that I've just created using uh, these default RPG Maker assets. And while this is normal of like a standard JRPG that would be made using this program, we don't want to use this. We want to have our side-scroller element and we can accomplish that by uh, creating tiles uh, like this. Actually, hang on, just give me a moment. Um, and just create them on this surface. This is obviously not what we want because we don't want the lines or anything. But the uh, idea still stands that we're going to use these side uh, 
these tiles to create a sort of side-scrolling uh, environment. So let me explain how these tile sets are usually organized in the Lisa game. Obviously, because we want to highlight uh, three-dimensionality of things and depth, uh, we require three unique tiles, actually, sorry, six unique tile sets for uh, our uh, basic assembly of what I'll call just like a, a, a three by two grid. So if you notice here, we have a piece on the left, which acts as the leftmost bound, a middle piece, which you can use to extend the structure as long as you want, and then a rightmost piece, which has this little face that shows uh, an edge, which features some darker coloring. This just allows the player to know where things end, and since uh, in most Lisa games, the player is moving from left to right, uh, that's why that structure will always be the uh, rightmost tile at the top face of this structure. Now, I've seen in certain uh, unreleased fan works that people have been very creative with their work and have actually chosen to have a 3x3 three three grid where this second uh, tile set is actually its own unique structure or uh, design beneath the basic top structure. And that's perfectly fine. You'll just have to follow your own unique rule set uh, when you create that, and that will uh, come from practice. Now, you might be wondering, why are there two additional sets of these two tiles that are the uh, corner tiles? Well, a few reasons. One is organization's sake, but also, if I were to create a uh, an additional uh, creation off the side of this, and I'll show you in a second, I don't know if it's uh, noticeable to see here, but you notice how there's a bit of a uh, black space on this edge? That's because the default version of this features a little bit of empty space where uh, you actually have an edge that would actually put a hole through the other structures. So with that, when that occurs, you'll end up having like a little hole that exposes to the back of the parallax, which is the fancy word of the background. And you don't want that because that looks kind of ugly. So you have these alternate versions for when these cliffs overlap each other and you want to make it so that it's consistent. And the trick that is done, if you noticed uh, very carefully, let me see if I can put this against a contrasting background very briefly. Uh, if you notice at this edge, there's a little purple tile on a uh, purple edge to this tile. And this allows us to create sort of a, an illusion that this whole cliff side is continuous. So that's why we have multiple sets of these. Don't forget that because then uh, when you have cliffs, you'll have holes in them and it'll look gross and no one wants that. You don't have to worry about this on the, uh, well, actually you do have to worry about this on the other side. So I'll show you that again, uh, create another tile face. There we go. And again, we have a little black dot there, and we don't want that, so we'll go over here, and bam, it's continuous now. Problem solved. So that's the basic structure of this. Uh, so really, you can uh, click and hold this to create long chains of this. You can click your mouse and hold it down and move it continuously. Uh, you, the world is yours to, to make, really. Just make sure that you follow all the rules and keep things consistent. Now, a bit of artistic advice, because obviously, you know, people, if you're planning to make a Lisa fan game, uh, these days, I mean, the last time I was really involved was, you know, years ago, but I'll say that most people these days like to make all original asset works, and what that means is that they're going to make every single painstaking asset for their own game, and that's fine. That just means you'll need to take into account of techniques and things that the best artists in the Lisa community have used, and... Uh, just make sure that when you're doing this, reference uh, reference it works like this, which have good tile sets. Um, make sure you have a good understanding of color theory. I'm, I'm no artist. I'm just telling you things that you know you should do. You should get a understanding for form and structure when you're making things like this. Before everyone rushes to the to you know, to say, well, you know, I'd like to see what you make. Uh, no, I'm not claiming to be any authority on art. I'm just saying you should get a, a learned perspective on fundamentals. You know, as I am trying to do myself in my free time to make my own uh, RPG Maker stuff. 
Uh, it just helps, though. It just helps if you have a good understanding of this because then things will come to you more naturally and you'll be, uh, it'll be easier for you to make uh, nice-looking things, so to speak. There you go. In addition, uh, in landscaping things, uh, typically you want to avoid being in a situation where, I'll show you right now, you have like these big structures that are just looming over the map. When you're going to be uh, looking at the game itself, when you're going to be playing it, you'll just be looking up at this and you'll have this boring looking mountain face to have to work with. And you don't want that. So the way we remedy that is we can create little... Uh, sort of mini uh, mini cliffs off the side of this. And they can have, you know, varying amounts of, of depth and detail uh, based on if you want the player to actually be able to reach these places or if you just want something, some eye candy um, in the midst of all this. And hey, if we actually have enough space here, let's see. We do. Oh, hang on. So the way we actually uh, assemble an igloo is we can put it here. There you go. This also brings in another element of tile sets. Uh, if you're working with the tile set, you can't paste over elements um, onto already existing ones. As you just saw, this creates its own uh, thing in the middle of this and ruins all of our work. So the way we fix that... Oh, hang on. Let me actually fix something really quick. Okay, great. Uh, the way we fix this uh, is by either putting it onto a next, uh, a different slide of the uh, the, the uh, tile set. But you see, there's an a B C D E side, and if we actually go to tile sets, I can show you here. We go to area for alt. Um, they have their own unique segments, and they're all their own distinct files. Uh, the way we do that, then, you see, if we put them now, um, they will overlap the A side. Uh, things which is what we want we want to uh be able to see our uh tile sets over our things especially if we're trying to avoid having to program events to uh to put things on our map because events are their own hassle um and having things on the map just makes it a little easier to work with everything and we can even put in some snow uh excuse me yeah, let me try and see if I can just get some snow patches here. There you go. And you can you can try to fudge it. It's not too easy to do that, but um, it's possible if you're if you're clever enough, so to speak. You can also just again go into the program yourself and. Uh, try and learn or like use paint or something to try and make something yourself uh, But again, uh, it's all comes down to you taking the time to uh, Really establish these things yourself. Here's here's a here's a three tile one. Oh, hang on. I don't want to do that. I just wanted one of these There we go so there, that's uh, how you get uh, your different structures onto this. And actually, if we go back and, uh, yeah, if you put an A tile over uh, an existing B, C, D, or E tile, uh, that undoes your progress. So be careful and make sure you get all your A stuff first, like your framework. But as soon as you do that, you can just go back and fix if you make a mistake. Though keep records of everything. Make sure you uh, save frequently because... Uh, not doing that uh, is your own uh, is a punishment unto itself. <laughs> also, you can see here that uh, B, C, D, and E tiles all have uh, the same level of uh, authority over one another. So I'm trying to put this peak of this tree onto here and it's not letting me. So the way we can fix this is by making either the tree an event or the... Uh, the ice, uh, the igloo, its own event. Or we can just simply move the tree and not have to worry about eventing, which is what I'm going to do just because I'm a little lazy and I just want to move on to something else uh, ASAP. So I'll put this tree here away from this and I'll just rearrange the snow just so we can have it uh, 
like this, and like this. There we go. And now we have an igloo. And we can actually travel inside this igloo so if we uh, so wish. But for now, uh, we're going to leave this as that. That's our map. We've got a map right now. And we can even put a little thing on the side. If we so choose. Cool. Great. So now what? Um, well, now that we have a, a map and we have stuff to work with, uh, we can actually uh, go in and play through the game. Now, uh, one of the benefits of working with an already existing game with its own tile sets is that if we go in here, you'll notice that there's a lot of stuff that is uh, pre-programmed. I'm um, clicking on this thing called Passage for Direction, which shows you that you can only move from left to right. The point of these four dots is to show you which direction it allows movement. And again, Lisa is a side scroller and vertical movement is only accomplishable through jumping events. So this just means that you'll only be able to move left and right. So you won't be able to clip through things. But when you're creating your own tile set, you'll have to do this yourself, which means that you'll have to painstakingly go through all of this. There are ways I'm pretty sure you can find that will allow you to uh, Oh, look, there's an, uh, a bug here. Get rid of that. Um, there are ways that you can go about doing this, I'm sure. But I just know that most people, uh, they usually have figured out, like, they, they usually just go through and painstakingly do this all. But if there is a developer watching of a different game and they're like, oh, I figured out a way to do this, or hell, even the developer of this game, uh, feel free to let me know. But... Uh, yeah, you'll have to go through this whole process, and it's it's a rather tedious one. That's one of the unfortunate uh, you know drawbacks of using RPG Maker is that it's a it's a very much antiquated program. So a lot of things that you would hope would be just standard fare are unfortunately not, and so you'll you'll just have to uh, recognize that when you're walking uh, walking yourself through all these steps. That it's like I'll probably have to create a bunch of new things just to uh, get this thing to work. Okay, now that we have a map, let's actually work through how do you set up all these events. So what are events, you probably are wondering. Or if you're not new to RPG Maker, you're like, okay, just kind of give me a quick rundown. So events are little tiles that you can put on top of your already existing map for the player to interact with the game and have things happen. It's the main way you actually accomplish making a game. Without events, nothing will happen. At most, your character will just waddle around ad infinitum. Like, you can't do anything without uh, events, so to speak. So, if you're planning to get into this, you really got to learn how to use events because they're going to be your best friend. So, let's see. How do you, uh, how do you utilize this? Well, let's start with jumps first. So when you face an edge, obviously, and Lisa, you know that if you face down and hold the shift, or sorry, the enter key or the space button or the X key or whatever allows you to execute your function, you'll jump down. Uh, but how does that happen? I'll show you. So there are two checks that are performed uh, before this actually uh, executed. So what is all this stuff you see on your screen? It's very simple, actually. Uh, priority doesn't matter because we're not dealing with any art assets. If we were, we would worry about this. Excuse me. With low characters, or actually all these priorities, these refer to um, what is going to be oriented three-dimensionally, I'm using air quotes when I say that, in the uh, final result of the game. If you have something that's below characters, if we were to say like this tree I'm highlighting with my cursor, if it's not picking up, it's the tree next to the two bushes. If that tree were an event, um, and it was selected to be below characters, the player would walk in front of it. If it were the same as characters, the player would bump into it and they couldn't progress past it. If it's above characters, it will be in front of the character as they walk past it, but they can still pass through it. So priority really only matters when we're dealing with uh, objects that uh, we uh, can see. But if you want an easy way to prevent a player from moving into an area, you can put a same as characters event so if you were just to think, if I was like, oh, uh, I want to stop Beltboy right here and force him to, you know, complete a thing before he walks any further to the right, I could put a same as characters event on the tile I've selected and the player would not be able to move past this point. 
getting back to the actual event itself to understand this there are things that we need to understand called conditional branches what's a conditional branch a conditional branch basically says that uh, we need to check something before the process can continue. What's nice about RPG Maker is that they also have else uh, conditional branches, which if we open it up and look at it, we have this thing that says down here, set handling when conditions do not apply. That just means that if we want something to happen, if the player has not met a parameter, um, we can allow the program to do that. But since we're not going to fudge any, uh, any data, let's leave it as is. So here we have a trigger that says the action button, which is again, X space, enter, whatever you choose to align your uh, action key with. This means that the pressing of action button will cause the event to initiate and it will go to the first line here. And then it checks a few things. Are you pressing the down key? You can't simply jump down by uh, pressing, uh, uh, pressing enter. You actually have to be you know, holding the down key for this to progress. Another way of doing this is also by having the character face a direction. That's also a perfectly legitimate way of completing this. But it was chosen to have the down button pressed. Next, it checks who is in the party, because if you've played through uh, Lisa the Hopeful, hopefully, uh, you will know that you can have different party members. Interestingly enough, this is probably some unused code because uh, you can't actually get alternate party members in this area, so I remember, but uh, this is because I'm using an older version of the game that this is still possible. Uh, after you have the check for who's in your party, uh, it does a few things. Firstly, it'll play a sound effect. I think you've probably heard this one before. Yep. And then you're going to have your characters, uh, you're going to have what's called a move route, which it basically just means what is your character going to do you have a whole series of different things that it can do um i would recommend trying to study up these they're very straightforward uh changing graphics is one that lisa games use all the time uh here this just changes belt boy's uh sprite into a jumping sprite and moves him down one it's sort of an illusion uh, really another set of uh, rpg maker illusions that allow us to uh do things that are cool in the program. We're not, so to speak, actually jumping um, and the game is handling that for us. We're changing the sprite and moving them down a single space. Excuse me. And then, once that's finished, we have to actually revert our sprite back to normal because if we have a different sprite based on a certain condition, we obviously don't want that character to uh, be looking weird uh, if something is going on. We want it to uh, look normal. Here's some, uh, basically I will call them not hidden, but they are, uh, they are common events that we can examine in the later video that allow us to understand how certain things are uh, actually accomplished in RPG Maker. But for now, we're just going to stay worrying about jumps. So let's uh, let's keep this. We're going to steal this for a second, and I'm going to show you uh, really how to assemble a common event to do stuff like this. So we put jump, common event. Making common events is a really great way to keep your... Uh, games organized because instead of having to make like all this over and over again you just have to make a common event that says I'll show you call common event jump common event and that's it that's all you have to put here and that's it it will handle the processing in the common event and you can just draw from the same source instead of having to rewrite something over and over and over again so that's that's a really easy way to uh, to do that Excuse me. Uh, so now, we'll also have to keep in mind that if we want the reverse, we need an upward jumping mom uh, jumping uh, uh, common event. So we can't actually have these both in the uh, in the game because 
if a player were to be standing here, let me show you here, and it used the same common event, the player could actually jump and clip out of the map, which would break the game. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to have jump common event one, and then jump common event two. Now, there are alternate ways of doing this, and obviously people can rush and say, oh, there's a more efficient way of doing this. But I'm just showing you like the general idea of how you would go about assembling this. When you're more experienced with a program, um, there are a lot of other ways that you can go about doing this, and I'm already thinking of a few in my head. Um, you could obviously try and do something where the game checks uh, at what height are you at, like at what location you are, uh, and like have it see like, oh, if, if you're at this height, this X and Y coordinate, you're not gonna be able to jump any lower, um, so just skip to this other area. Or uh, you can have something where uh, you you set parameters within the game that prevent you from jumping lower or higher into areas where you can't reach. But this this is just a very straightforward way of being able to do it that I think helps uh, people who may be new to this. Okay, let's also get one thing out of the way. Uh, directions are a little weird in this. What's nice about RPG Maker is that things move from left to right. Uh, but as you move down, they, the numbers get higher rather than lower. So, I mean, that might make sense for some, but that means intuitively you have to recognize when you're jumping, you have to add numbers to go down and then subtract numbers to go up. It's a little weird and it takes some getting used to, but, uh, when you get it, you get it. The last thing we have to understand is walking off cliffs, something that's very common in Lisa games. Now, obviously in cliffs, you just have to walk up to them and then you'll fall off. In Lisa games, that's a staple of things. You don't get a chance to sort of do over. Uh, once you reach the tile, you're falling off. But in Lisa the Hopeful and also in Lisa the Joyful, you can dash and this game also has a check that uh, checks if you're dashing or not and will take care of uh, the added distance based on if you were running at the time or not. So this again just shows you uh, how this is uh, accomplished. A simple fall, you'll just be adding to a number to get down. This is just like if you jumped, but if you run off, you actually gain a bit of extra distance to the right, and the game will actually give you a unique... Uh, well, it won't give you anything unique, but it'll just move you to the right a, a distance based on if you're holding your uh, shift key. In this case, the A button. That's the analog to the shift key on a default keyboard in RPG Maker's uh, internal weird keyboard things. But we can use this as... Uh, we'll call this... Simple cliff fall and then put one tile because this is a one tile fall. And now let's go over here. Let's actually start setting some stuff up. So action button, call common event, jump common event one. And we can set this up here and here. However, uh, we'll also have to check a few things. So, oh, we'll have to check uh, because this can go both up or down, you need to uh, check what keys are being held when this is happening. So if the down button is being pressed, we want to jump down. But if the jump up button is being pressed, um, we want the jump up thing. So jump common event uh, one is a jump. Uh, hang on, let me just make sure. I think I'm confusing myself a little bit here. Apologies. Jump common event is going down. So we want actually this event to be here. And then, yeah. Jump common event one will be our down button press. And then up button will be our number two common event. And we can copy this. 
and there you go. Now we can also create a common event. That's an event touch. And what that means is that simply the event needs to touch the player. Uh, what that means is this tile, the player needs to interact with it um, in order for the event to happen. So then we will put call common event, simple cliff fall one tile. Now, obviously, uh, actually, Let's use a little uh, actual uh, careful thought logic here because now I'm realizing that if you look at this uh, simple cliff fall, this will actually take us two spots and that'll have Boat Boy floating in the air. So I'm just going to put one for now just to keep things a little simpler. And this is actually only if we're. Uh, going to the right. So let's make a version that's for the left and it's two tiles. The heights are going to be the same but instead we're going to be moving now two to the uh, two to the left and Sorry, the heights would not be the same if it's two heights because we have to reflect that it's two tiles now. And now we drop two if Belt Boy just simply walks over to this edge. There we go. So now let's copy this and we call this simple fall two tile. Excuse we can actually make a uh, another version of this that's simply called one tile because we have a one tile version of this. And copy this, put this there and make this a one tile version. Okay. Now, time for the funny thing. Uh, hopefully that was instructive. And if anyone's like, oh, could you please explain this? Just go through this move route and, and understand it. We're changing the graphic to uh, reflect the character's jumping. We're actually doing the jumping, and then we're changing the graphic back when it's done. We also have a sound effect at the start of it because we don't want it after the whole thing has taken place. That's how it goes for all of these. The only thing you're going to change is how far and how um, how low or high you're going to actually jump up to or down to. That's up to you. Now the last thing we have to do is fall off animations. And these are pretty straightforward. We can again copy from the source material. Now, obviously, uh, one thing you'll note if we actually go to each one of these individually, I know I, I look pretty stupid counting the numbers myself, but it's for a good reason. Um, you can see that at each height, uh, we have to change the distance that the character is falling from because if it drops too low, the character will drop out of the, uh, out of the screen and we don't want that. So uh, we have to reflect this when we're making each of our death animations. So here, we look how far it is from the bottom. That's four to 12, so it's uh, an eight fall. And this is to the left, so let's take this and put this into a common event. I didn't mean to open scripts. I meant to open common events. And we'll call this death cliff fall left eight tiles. And it will be this. And we just have to call the common event. Death cliff fall left eight tiles. And we put an event touch here. Nice. And we can obviously do the same with this for over here, but this time we'll prematurely set it to the next common event. 
we're going to make it such that it's a right fall and we're going to reflect that uh, with a plus one excuse me just for a second just to make sure how much leeway I have here uh, yeah I'll stick with one just because it's a little more sure and yeah there you go and then let's also do one more that's a death fall uh, death cliff fall right and we'll set it to nine tiles And we won't add any uh, X here, just so, because the player's already at the absolute limit. Um, and we'll make sure to also not neglect the nine uh, change. Okay. And now we just put another event touch here and we make it so that the death cliff fall is nine tiles. And now let's actually uh, set our starting position. And let's also do one other thing. Um, because by default the characters have no uh, walk sprites, we're going to have to put this ourselves just for testing purposes. We're going to take this out when we're done. But uh, we just got to put one in for right now. Okay, and now we can get started. Oh, let's also not forget to put some music. This is a very easy way to do this. So if you want music to always be consistent in an area, um, you gotta turn on this thing called Auto Change BGM. Click on these three dots and you can put any music you want at any different pitch. Make sure that you use a pretty decent audio. Don't put anything too loud and make sure that your audio is consistent across your game. So, oh, let's not continue. Let's start a new game. Well, I should put a parallax there. Excuse me, let me just add that in. Uh, where is... Yeah, there we go. Let's put that in. So now can see the game is working I should mention also that I made a mistake in uh, forgetting to remember that these are the uh, wind animation sprites which is okay the same principles still apply here Apologies about that. Okay, the bug has been fixed. So what was it? Well, by default, a map doesn't contain any tiles whatsoever. So I simply have to go through the process of painstakingly putting uh, all these uh, blank tiles that allowed for the player to move through them to uh, actually get the game to work. So I'll show you now. We can now fall off all these different tiles. And we can fall to our death. Woohoo! You also notice that there's sound now, and that wasn't there before. How's that accomplishable? Well, there's actually a script in the game called Galv's Region Effects. I'll show you where it is now. And what this does is it allows us to put sound effects on what are called region tiles. And by using these, we can create uh, sound when we walk over them. Each region tile has its own unique noise. So we have snow version and then some soft stepping noises that we can use. I would recommend you go and uh, investigate the script, learn how it works, 
Uh, it's pretty, again, straightforward. Most of the stuff here is really easy to get a hang of. If you have questions, you can always ask me, but it's a pretty straightforward way, a uh, forward thing to understand. And very helpful, too. Because as you saw before, we didn't have any sound effects, and making it so that we have events to do that is not preferable. Now, there's one last thing I want to show you, and it's how we make internal versions of maps. So, let me show you how that's done. First thing we have to do is put no parallax inside. And we can do that by uh, just using a pitch black parallax. Now, I say pitch black, but in actuality, you don't want to use something that's pitch black for one reason. And that is that if you do something that's pitch black, um, it's not going to look very pretty. You use a very specific uh, black color to actually, I won't say pretend, but to make it a little easier on the eyes when we're actually working with it. So let's, let me show you uh, how we set up the inside of the igloo. So we have uh, here references that show us how it's done. Uh, there are a few things that we can do. Uh, if you notice here, uh, the inside of the igloos, they feature a few things. Namely, they feature just the igloo and none of the additional tiles, so we can actually uh, get rid of most of this junk. I won't call it junk, but you know what I'm trying to say. It's, uh, it's stuff that we don't need as it pertains to the igloo itself. So we're going to just put this for now. Oop. This. And you also probably have noticed uh, some... Some neat little tricks that were also being done there, like oh, want to use black. Okay, I guess you're not gonna let me do that, huh? All right, there we go. Uh, we can use these black tiles that are impermeable to prevent the player from. Uh, getting in, so to speak. And these black tiles will also, I believe, synchronize with the uh, parallax. If we actually show this in the editor, you can choose that option here. Uh, oh, looks like they're a little too, uh, a little too bright. So we can use this alternate tile that actually has the correct black to uh, achieve this. We can also get rid of these events to uh, we're not going to be jumping around in here or at least i don't know maybe you want to put jumping in there but in any case uh, we won't be uh so how do we actually create the illusion of we're inside the igloo you can actually use these cave pieces as you see in the igloos to create the illusion that we're uh inside in addition you can also use the darker tile set to make it look like there's a change in lighting we go back and we put the cave overlays. There you go. We've recreated a igloo indoor. And we can actually even put this, and I believe... Oh, it's one tile off. I messed up. Whoops. There we go. Now, if you flip between them, oh geez, I messed up twice? Hang on, let me compare. Um, let me find a point of reference. Oh, because these are two different maps. So yeah, it should, it should link up. Just trying to figure out why it isn't. Maybe it's just because I'm being stupid. Yeah, that's probably it. If all else fails, it's probably just my own uh, ineptitude that's preventing me from getting something right. Now if we flip back. Whoop. Yep, there you go. So now what do we got to do? Well, now that we have an interior, we can uh, flip between here and there. We uh, simply have it so that 
can create a co conditional branch. That's going to be an action button if we are facing up. And we're going to leave it as an action button because we obviously want to press in. Uh, transfer player. Now, this is important. Transfer player is how we get between different maps or different areas of maps. Um, don't use fade because it will uh, it will uh, not look good. But if you want to have a little uh, bit of detail in here, you should have it that the character is facing down so that they're actually having default position when they walk into a room instead of facing up. So you'll see what this looks like in a moment. And we're going to have them teleport to its back inside um, to the uh, appropriate analog. And there you go. And we post this in here. And then we can transport ourselves outside. Now you're also welcome to uh, move the uh, and add an extra event here. Let me show you what that would look like. Um, and have it come out to this side. And then do the same on the other side. So that it's a little more fair to the player so they don't have to be exactly on the tile when they click it. And let's actually decorate a little bit inside. Maybe put in an NPC or something. I just try to put something fitting, I guess. And just leave him there. I'd also recommend if you're having characters, character events, you should also uh, name them too. Because then when you're going to work with them later, it just makes it so much easier to work with. So here, this is, uh, I'll just go back and bring a copy of this just so you see. And this is, yeah, still the event three. So slash et... Um, that just means that you're going to create a text box above event three and it will have that text. And let's just put a little more decor in here. Oh, oh that's not what I wanted. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Okay, that takes care of that. Woohoo. Now, I think everyone remembers this, how to make a battle. It's the only thing I've left you with for years now. So, we're gonna add a battle. Okay. 
And now we just have to do a few things. So I'll just show you how to generally form a bat. So let's find Wayne. He's here somewhere. There he is. So at turn zero, uh, what you have to do when you start a battle is you need to do a few things. Um, you have to give your character like buffs and stuff at the start of the fight, but also you need to do one really, 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 really important thing. You can add the entire troop. You have to get them a status effect called Alive. What is Alive? It just means if we go to your... It resists being KO'd. And the reason is, is that if you remember at the end of every Lisa fight, uh, generally well-programmed ones, um, the character says a thing and then they explode. So, here, let me show you in, like, this, uh, there's a fade-out BGM which stops the music when the character's uh, HP is below zero, or equal to zero, I should say. There's text. And then it shows this death, which is the flashing thing. It plays the death music, and then they explode, and then they lose that alive status effect and are killed off. So I'll paste something similar. And I'll wait in a little extra just so you see what happens if that uh, were to occur. Um, let me just change his stats because I, all the characters are going to be level one. Um, so I'll just make him like 500 and this attack will be like 20. And this two. Okay. So let's check out how that would work. Oh, actually, let me not forget one really important thing. We're going to actually have the battle take place, because I didn't put that in. And we're actually going to uh, add a, a bit of post... Um, post... Uh, battle uh, stuff that was really descriptive yeah um, let's find a wolf fade up 10 okay let me just make sure that is yeah. so now you can see what happens here um, we're gonna put this as a script and we're going to add a self switch, which will make it so then this is off. I gotta change the music to something else. Alright, that's fine. Okay, so now I'll walk in and talk to this guy. And there we go. That's it. And that character will be permanently uh, permanently dead. And we can improve that a little bit. Maybe, you know, here. Just make them a little beefier. We'll go over game balance in a later video. I just wanted to show off that this was uh, possible. And now that you've seen what happens when it delays a little bit, I'll show you what happens when it runs uh, normally as smooth.
right. That's how it, that goes. All right. Oh. Oh, you might notice there's a little glitch here with the tree. That happens if uh, with non-event stuff. So let's actually fix that as the last thing I'll show off in this video. I know I already said I was going to do more, but uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a little tired. So uh, this will be it. So uh, here, let's uh, put in a... See if there's a common... Uh, there's a tree. There's probably a tree somewhere. Someplace. If not, it's really easy just to make a, a thing. I'm sure it's somewhere. Let's go check the... Uh... Nope, there isn't. Whoops, okay. We'll just, uh, I guess, put the tree up top then. That might be the solution. Or better yet. see if I can salvage this. I probably can. Just gotta put like one little shop here and uh, that and that. There we go. That solves that. Now we go into the game. <sighs> it's good to go. Okay. I think that's it. I've covered all my bases or the topics of this video. Um, so yeah, I think that'll about do it. I uh, hope you enjoyed. Sorry that this took a, like, a year to come out, but... Uh, not just a year, like three years for Pete's sake, but I hope you enjoyed. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you have more stuff you'd like to see, I'll probably see maybe if I feel like making another video, but, you know, with my luck, I'll probably end up just answering our comments specifically. Have a nice day, and, uh, thanks for tuning in for more Lisa content.